Yeah. So um, yeah. So how have you how you been finding Fire Island so far, and how have you been adapting to the time difference? Yeah, the Fire Island, the whole the whole thing is always interesting. Anytime you go overseas, whether it's a few hours ahead or you know, like here where where I'm from in Denver, it's about ten hours ahead. So that the the biggest obstacle with that for us is that <clears throat> the the UFC is fighting on the United States mm -hmm. time schedule. So because of that, then the athletes are going to be fighting technically in the states. They'd be fighting Saturday evening. Yeah. But it's 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 Sunday morning here early. So you know they're fighting in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the time here, they're fighting somewhere between 4 a.m. and 7.30, you know, somewhere around there a.m. So the hardest part is staying on the state schedule, which means that we're sleeping when it's sunny and we're up when it's dark. Like right now, obviously, we're, we're together and it's uh, it's dark outside. Yeah, It's 4 a.m., but technically it's, it's the evening in the state. So... Yeah. Um, I've screwed that up a lot in my in my years of coaching athletes. Uh, I'd screw that up at the beginning when I first went overseas and didn't didn't understand that. If we were fighting on on the time here, it would be it would be easy. But then we would just adjust to the time here. Yeah. But since we're not, um, I've learned over time that that's the way to do it. So there's there's challenges there. It's uh, you feel nocturnal for sure. Yeah. And um, it's not the easiest thing to do. I, I'd be lying if I said it was, but. I think that's the best solution, and obviously we had Brandon Royval stay on that schedule, and he was able to perform and feel good. Mm -hmm. And then you know we have we have uh, Luigi fighting on the third, and then Yusuf Zalal fighting on the tenth. So we're gonna keep with that same system, given my experience, and then how Brandon felt. So sure. yeah, no, that's great. And obviously you mentioned Royval there as well, and he had a great victory over Kaikar France last weekend. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on how you guys felt about that victory and um, where do you see his future going in the UFC? Yeah, you know, Brandon Royval, I've, I've had the opportunity and, and just experience to train him since he was a teenager. And obviously he's come a long way from the kid riding his bicycle to the gym mm -hmm. and working overnight to, you know, being... Uh, in the top 10 in, in the UFC in, in the flyweight division. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see. It's really, to be honest, I've had this question a lot leading up to him coming to the UFC, obviously in the UFC. And then after his fight against Kai, we've had, I've had that, this question a lot. It's, it's pretty hard for me to explain in detail with words how I feel because sure. it almost feels like one of your children because oh, yeah, um, sure, yeah. right. I've trained him for so long and seen just how his whole road, you know, in MMA. Mm -hmm. And so to say I'm proud would be a, a, an understatement. Um, to watch him go out and perform like he did is, I told Alex Hernandez, Alex is here with us. Alex is a new addition to Factory X. And uh, I brought Alex out here for a, a bunch of reasons, but he was in the corner with me. And before the fight, he was like, well, you know, what's, how's Brandon? He's never obviously cornered Brandon. How's Brandon fight? And I said, Brandon is, uh, you're going to see some stuff you've probably never seen before with him fighting. He's just, he's just very much that way, you know? And of course, to uh, get hit with a right hand early, which we knew was one of Kai's biggest weapons, um, we didn't avoid that thing early. And he got, he got flashed a little bit from that. But to hit a spinning back elbow off that is not lucky for Brandon because that's something that he's done a lot. If you go watch his career for, um, just his whole pro career, him doing that, you I bet you there's a two, three minute, you could do a two, three minute highlight reel of him hitting people with elbows. So uh, it, I was shocked in the sense of the timing of it, but I wasn't shocked in him actually executing it. So to watch him go on and dominate after that point um, was a really proud moment for myself, all of our coaches at home and our team and of course his family. So uh, and to do it overseas, he's never been out of the country before. So to yeah. do all that stuff, you know, put all that into one one umbrella, it's really cool to see. It's cool to have those kind of new experiences as a fighter, yes. like traveling overseas and stuff. And I know, obviously, 
uh, Court McGee's on the card as well. And you, you've worked with him in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to get your opinion on on his fight against Condit this weekend. Yeah. And how you see those guys um, match up against each other. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a fun matchup. It's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, is... I, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but it's like a novelty fight. Mm -hmm. It's cool to see, yeah, yeah, you know, sure. it's a cool, it's a cool fight to see. Both those guys have made a lot of waves in their, in their young MMA career. And they've, they've sustained a position in the UFC for as long as they both have done. Mm -hmm. It's hard, it's really tough to get to the UFC, but it's even harder to stay here. Mm -hmm. And they both have proven, even with ups and downs in their career in the UFC, that they're still around, and you can't do anything but respect that. Uh, both of those guys are are trailblazers for the the sport, and you know you've got you got two exciting guys still in the mix in MMA. Um, I would say they're both on the in the twilight of their of their careers. That doesn't mean it's the end, but I'm just saying it's getting toward the end there, mm -hmm. and it, it's cool to watch just the progress the progression from both those guys. So that fight just for as a fan is, I mean, how do you not want to yeah, see that? Sure, you know, sure. and, and obviously you've seen the skill level they both bring and you've seen some of the trials that they've had to go through to, to even get to Abu Dhabi to fight each other. I think that's what makes it an exciting fight is all of that stuff that's happened in the past brings them to this one moment where they can still feel that rejuvenation of youth and vigor and hey I got I'm gonna fight in MMA again and my career is not done you know I'm gonna show you guys that that attitude um, I think it's cool to see that's a, that's a part of why I think that makes for a fun fight and stylistically they're different and so but they're both going to exchange on the feet they both can grapple um, and I would say, I would give Court the edge on the wrestling side, mm -hmm. um, but Condit's really nasty off his back. So, sure. and you know, so I would say that 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 whole piece where they're, they're going to strike, uh, Court has a little advantage in the wrestling, but Condit's nasty on the ground off his back. It makes for a dynamic fight, and it's cool to see two trailblazers get in there and mix it up. Yeah, that's cool. I'm really looking forward to that fight. On the Me too. And obviously. Uh, Factory X um, is your gym, and, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great talent coming out there, and there's, there's been a lot of great talent coming out in the past. You work with like Anthony Smith, James Krause, and um, I just wanted to know kind of the key elements within that environment of how you you maintain a consistent level of, of success with that group of people. The the way I have found to to keep success over the years of doing this is to make sure the number one ingredient is culture. Mm -hmm. I think culture is the key ingredient. Everyone has their own culture. So I'm not saying mine's the right way and the only way, but for me, it is the right way. And for us as a collective group, that's the culture that I want. And that's the culture that I demand. And then in turn, they've got to own that culture and, and agree that that's what fits them and then continue to produce that culture moving forward. And so I think culture is the biggest thing. We have amazing coaches. I have amazing athletes. I just did an interview recently where I said, out of all my years in coaching MMA, this is the most talented room of fighters I've ever had. It's also the most talented room of coaches that I've ever had. And that whole recipe is has been designed around, do you fit in this culture? I started the culture that I want to have, but will they carry it, will they carry it out and will they carry it through when I'm not there? Mm -hmm. when I'm on the road. Uh, one day when I'm not coaching anymore. Um, you know, you, you a, another person potentially comes in and my, I hope they keep it to the core, right? Because that culture is key when it comes to housing type A people, type A athletes, yeah. and understanding that this is bigger than just I. And so there is a collective we in there, even though it's just them themselves, 
getting in the cage by themselves. I get it. But they would have never gotten there without the whole collective group. Sure. And it's got to be fun. That's the other thing is, is uh, you know, fighting is the only thing past fighting is is war, right? And so it's such that that, that teeter tot taught edge of just like you know it's so close to being that war type thing and i'm not trying to act like it is in in over like the military and what they do because i respect them a ton but Mm -hmm. when you're on that edge of that it, it if you're not having fun with the whole process of what you're doing it becomes it's way too hard the sport is really really hard it's one of the it's one of the toughest i think the toughest sport there is it's it's so tough mentally and it's obviously really tough physically and so but you gotta have some fun you know and so the the culture of that that all that stuff has to happen and you know i always tell the guys i require three 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 things from you guys show up on time every day work hard when you're there and lastly most important listen right and so if they can do those three things and they can do that consistently for 10, 15 years, then they actually have an opportunity to go do something at the highest level in the sport. Um, so, you know, the answer to all of that and, and what encompasses all that is just culture. I think, I think that's the most important thing. We, we have amazing technique. We have amazing philosophies. We have amazing facility and, and, and a team and coaches. Uh, but if if the culture's not intact, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, it's like you said, um, the whole fun aspect as well of it. And I know we we were in here yesterday with our court, and, mm-hmm. and he mentioned where well, expressed that um, he didn't necessarily find fighting fun. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to know your opinion on that. And also, do you think that changes the way a fighter approaches their their competitors? Yeah, I think I think if you're, I always I always say you have to be able to whistle while you work, right? Yeah. And I get it when you get in the cage, it, it, it's you know it's time to it's time to go. But I think the guys you see do the best are the guys that are living in the moment, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. uh, we just saw in the main event last week, Adesan, Adesanya and uh, Costa mm-hmm. fight. Regardless of the winner, the point is they both are in the moment. Yeah. If you remember one time Adesanya threw a high kick, mm-hmm. Costa mi- made him miss, and he was kind of like, yeah, like yeah, oh yeah. that you know that it's was like, that was no yeah exactly yeah, that yeah, was yeah. no big deal. He was in the moment there. Mm-hmm. Um, Adesanya was in the moment. He was he was talking back and finding yeah. his swag, and that's what I mean by having fun. I'm not saying I'm not saying like we're sitting there telling jokes to each other. Yeah. But man, you're locked in the moment, and you're not so you're not you don't have the blinder feel of it. You can still still see and hear peripheral, right? And but you're locked in on target. I get it. You gotta be locked in on target, but not so much so that it's just straight tunnel vision, yeah. no peripheral view, no no opportunity to enjoy the process of what's going on. And I know some of that comes with experience, but and some of what makes them dangerous, especially at the beginning, is that. They get locked into tunnel vision, and yeah. sometimes it works for them. But I think to sustain a career through mixed martial arts, and especially at this level, mm-hmm. consistently year in year out, is you gotta you gotta find that enjoyment and in, in the process of what you're doing, and that that what I call swag. You gotta find your swag. Yeah. Right. And so, um, those are two examples of of people having fun in there. I know Costa didn't get the result he wanted, and Adesanya did, but it's not about the result. It, no. it, it, I mean, it is, but ultimately, we might talk about that fight for another couple days. Yeah. Once these fights start Saturday night, mm-hmm. no one's talking about that anymore. No, they forgot. Sure. Yeah. And so that's the that's the craziest part about sports is, yeah, they're going to talk about it for a few days, but it'll roll over again, mm-hmm. and they're not they don't. They don't even remember. In in six months, you're gonna be like, "Who did he fight again?" Half the people are gonna do that. Yeah. And so, did you did you find your swag? Did you enjoy that moment? And that's what I mean when I when I say have fun is 
Um, you're not just sitting in there fake smiling because yeah. you're forcing something. Mm -hmm. You're in the moment. You're having fun. You, you don't have blinders. You, you have a peripheral view, yeah, yeah. both in your ears and your eyes, you know. And so uh, that's when that's when guys perform the best. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, obviously, I know um, <clears throat> I know you're you're kind of uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your first love was like boxing, mm -hmm. and uh, I just wanted to know if if was coaching always something you wanted to go into. Was it um, like when you when you first started out, boxing was your first love, but was coaching something you always wanted to step into, or was it something that that just kind of came? And yeah. you, you, fell, you fell into it. Yeah, was coaching what I always wanted to do? No, no. <laughs> not at all. I actually was like all the guys I trained. I, I wanted to fight. Yeah. And, you know, I did, but I was obviously in the late 90s. It wasn't anywhere near what it is today, no. especially financially. Mm -hmm. Financially, there was no future really then. Um, and I, I started obviously later than what the guys start now these guys start as little kids mm -hmm. now you know and so i uh, started in my early to mid early 20s you know which is a late start mm -hmm. in in mixed martial arts mm -hmm. so no the answer is no um the reason i started coaching is because three months into training uh the coaches there one of the coaches couldn't make it for whatever reason i can't remember car issue or something and they came to me and said hey would you teach the class tonight I was like I haven't been here but a few months I don't know what the hell I'm doing you know and they're like you know more than you think and my point in telling that story is that they believed in me way more than I believed in myself especially yeah. when it came to the coaching side I just didn't recognize it because I was in straight student mode like I, I just want to learn you yeah. know and I fought it for a long time just I would teach but I don't, I, uh, that's fine. I was doing it to trade for dues. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be a coach uh, thinking where I'm at now mm -hmm. at all. And so they believed a lot in me at the beginning at first. And then I was really good at it. That's the other thing. I was really good at coaching. I, I have a good eye for details and I, I can motivate and I can also do. So, um, you know, that's that's something that, I think are key ingredients and I care. You have to be selfless when you're a coach. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's one of the most, it's, it's a tough job. Yeah. It's really tough. And so really rewarding, but it's, it's really tough. Um, it, it, you are never first and that's okay. I'm a very, I'm very much that my personality is that way. I'm a giver. So yeah. it suits me. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Um, but it, it, it wasn't what I thought I was going to do at all. And if you had asked me in in late the late 90s, in the early 2000s, even, you know, before 2008. And 2008 is when I officially started my own, you know, training yeah. guys on my own, officially with my own gym, Factory X, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. 2010 is when we made it a business, right? And so um, if you would have asked me before that time period, I, I would have been like, no, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, and I feel really blessed. That's the other thing I want to say is I feel super blessed by that. Uh, f fighting and coaching found me. Sometimes I feel like I found it, but yeah. it found me, you know, mm -hmm. I always tell that story. People say, Hey, what's one of your first experiences in, in mixed martial arts. And I always say boxing, of course, when I was a kid, cause I had a want and need to do that. I wrestled a little when I was a kid too. Um, but I always say at 1.30 in the morning uh, is when is when mixed martial arts found me. I saw Muay Thai on ESPN2. Uh, ISK kickboxing was coming on. They used to play it at, at all weird hours of the night. I want to say it was like 1.30 in the morning-ish. And I saw it and I was like, man, what the hell is that? That's really cool. You know, and so, and that was in 97, late 97, 98. And so I was like, man. That's, that's crazy cool, you know? And so uh, that's where, uh, you know, that's why I say that. It, I feel like when I look back at the journey, I didn't really fi find it. It kind of found me. Yeah, and then yeah. I've been inserted into where I am. And obviously now I'm a coach. And I've been a coach for a while now. And I love it. I, I, I love, it's not a job to me. It's, uh, it's, it, I get to do this. It's, uh, it's a crazy fun experience. 
a lot of hard work, but anything I was going to do in life, I was going to work my ass off. You know, I'm a, I'm a grinder. So, um, I'm, I'll grind all day and all night and all day and all night. And, and, and that's who I am. So whether I was doing this or a sales job for a corporation or whatever, uh, I would be working just like I'm working now. It's just, I, I, I wouldn't love that other side. Cause I, I've been in, I've been in the real world, you know, um, I didn't love that side at all. Mm-hmm. I love this. This yeah. is something that, um, I just love and I enjoy watching these young men and women go and just have these huge dreams and then every day have goals. And then one day, like Brandon Royval, for example, yeah. uh, you know, he's a teenager ever training and next, you know, blink, you look and you're like, holy shit, this kid's in his mid 20s now, mid to late 20s now. He's top five or 10 or whatever he is in the world. And and look at that. That's what wakes me up in the morning, yeah. you know? I, I can't even tell you what the hell these guys make. I, I don't even know. My wife deals with all that shit. I don't even know what the hell they make. So she's the one that collects all that. I, I don't ask. The only time ever that gets involved is when a manager comes and says, hey, you guys, you, you got a new contract, and then they'll they'll say it. But, I mean, that's not what wakes me up. What wakes me up is what is what we just saw with Brandon and and – uh, watching the the years of what he's done do that and and kids like Yusuf Zalal and and you know Alex Hernandez and Anthony Smith and yeah. James Krause so the resurgence of of those guys and you know that's the kind of stuff that you're like man that that's cool so I I'm I'm super blessed and happy that that mixed martial arts and and coaching found me and and that I was able to take my work ethic and culture and knowledge and and um, continue to become to be a student I'm, I'm just real grateful that I've been given that stuff so that I can continue to help others and and progress on oh, that's that's awesome not many, not many people can say that they love their job and yeah it's, it's um it's same for us as well we obviously um, work with Dan Dan Hardy and um you know, we, we love what we do. It's great to be here in mm-hmm. Fire Island and mm-hmm. stuff. And uh, off that uh, last question, I just wanted to know what your your most memorable and, and your proudest, I mean, I'm sure there's so many, but um, what's your proudest and most memorable moment as a coach? Man, most most proud and memorable moment. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you one. I, I don't think that's possible. Sure. It's been too many years doing this. Um, you know, just just one of the most memorable moments. Uh, there's there's a few here, but one of them is coming to my wife and saying, because I taught for ten years for zero dollars, I never made a dime. Coming to my wife and saying, "Hey, uh, I have an ability to make a little cash coaching these guy these fighters," and. My wife, I don't want this to sound like she didn't support me, but she she's a realist, right? Mm-hmm. She was like, okay, that's great. But don't quit your real your day job, you know? Yeah. And that never leaves my head because um, in a way, I agreed with her. Mm-hmm. I did. But I also knew what my vision was. And it's hard for others to know your vision until you actually show them that it's possible, yeah. right? Some of your biggest... <clears throat> um, opposition comes from internally Mm -hmm. not and I don't mean just you as a person but in your inner circle yeah right and so your parents or your girlfriend or your wife or your grandparents or whomever that's close in your inner circle they're typically the biggest opposition at the beginning yeah because they want what's best for you Mm -hmm. it's not out of it's not out of um trying to hurt you Mm -hmm. or 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 saying you can't do it maybe they maybe they don't think you can do it that that's a motivation potentially or it's not and then they shut that down and that did and then that just meant that it wasn't what you thought it was anyway but the point is that they want to see what's best for you and if if you if you go and say hey I'm going to be I'm going to be the best MMA coach in the world and and uh, I've never proven that that's even possible yet mm-hmm. it's a pipe dream I mean, realistically, it is. It doesn't mean that I can't make it happen because sure. I've, I've made it happen. Mm-hmm. But um, 
that moment when I told her that, that was something that always brings a smile to my face because I remember my head going, oh, I know where I'm going to go. And, and, I'm, and not that I wanted to prove my wife wrong. It's just I wanted to show her that I could do it. For sure. And she believed in me. Listen, my biggest supporter is her and still to this day. And she's, she's, the, she's my rock for sure. And uh, obviously when this thing got cooking and then, you know, we are where we are now, every once in a while a reminder. Um, <laughs> told you I could do this. And she's like, I know you did. And, um, but you need some of that. You need some of that opposition. That, that's, one thing that, that's one thing that comes to my mind. Um, another uh, thing that comes to my mind is uh, the first world title I ever won as a coach was with Joe Warren, mm-hmm. right, in Bellator. And, and Joe hasn't fought for a while now, but Joe Warren was a two-time Greco Olympic world champion and a three-time Bellator world champion. And before it was cool, he held two belts in two different weight classes. That wasn't cool then, you know? And so he did that only because Bellator at the time didn't have a 135-pound division. They had a 145-pound division. If you've ever met Joe, he's not a 145-pounder. And he was getting spun in 360 degree circles in the first rounds of a lot of those fights against Pitbull and Soto and all those guys, all those savages. And, but he was coming back and winning those fights and he went on to win three world titles. And the first world title I won with Joe is, is a huge memorable moment, you know? And we've had the ability to win three of those together. Um, we've also lost three together. And so uh, those are, those are that, that moment is, is crazy. Chris Camozzi was my first ever UFC fighter yeah. that, I, that I, you know, I coached him uh, on the regional scene right before he went to the UFC. And then a lot of people don't know this, but Chris has 20 UFC fights. You know, and so, you know, that that's always going to be a memorable moment in my head. Um, watching Ian Heinish um, win contender series yeah. after taking a loss in, in LFA and then going on to win the LFA belt and going into contender series and dominating, getting his contract. That was the first contender series uh, kid I ever had or um, him and Devonte Smith. Yeah. We're the first two that I ever had that won a, won the fight and actually won the 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 contract. And so, you know, those those type of moments, watching um Yusuf Zalal get signed after years and years of of just um you think this is gonna happen, watching him take two losses in a row on the regional scene, knowing that he's a lot better than what he was showing and watching his transformation and his growth and then getting a, a, a call up last minute to come and fight in the UFC. And now, you know, he, he fights on the, on October 10th. Yeah. And when he wins that fight, um, I think he'll be the only one in 2020 that has four wins. Cause right now there's only two other people other than him that are sitting on three wins in 2020. And so, you know, we've talked about Brandon Royval, but uh, it's worth mentioning again because to see a kid you've trained since he was a teenager, mm-hmm. to be in the top 10 in the world, to go fight two guys in the top 10 and finish them both, I mean, that that's what dreams are made of, right? And it's not the result, because the result's cool. I mean, it's cool. Go watch the fight. It was a great fight. It was awesome. But to, to know the road that it took to get there, to know the path and the time it took to get there, to know that that kid two times in his career had an entire fight card that he was on canceled and sit for two different times in his career for a year and never bitch once. Never bitched once about, coach, you know, what the hell, and never just got to work. And it proves that if this is really what you love, then it's not, you can't put all, you can't put everything in the results. It's got to be in the process. Yeah. Do you love the process? And that kid loves training and getting better. It's showing. People are like, wow, how is this kid dealing with it mentally and physically on the top 10 right now? He's beating some amazing athletes, and he, he has. Because both Tim Elliott and Kai, they're, they're amazing, yeah. amazing fighters. And so how? Because the kid has just been immersed into, into the love of, of mixed martial arts. So, you know, those things, seeing my kids grow up on the mat. Yeah. You know, my kids, I don't want them to fight at all. At all. But I absolutely love that they've been able to be on the mat and have learned mixed martial arts their whole life. My kids think fighting thinks fighting is normal. 
right? They don't think it's like most kids are like, Rah, you know, yeah, yeah. my kids yeah. thinks that think uh, that that shit's normal. Yeah. And so watching that and, and just and and, you know, watching um, my wife and I build something that even us at times didn't think was nearly possible. You know, those are things when you look back and you go, you, she and I have both had our hands in growing and building this. And we continue to do that moving forward. But when you look back, we just had a 10 year uh, anniversary of, uh, of a decade party for Factory X, the beginning of this year. <clears throat> and it was really cool to be able to reminisce and look back at, yeah. at, at the road we've been on. So to do that together, she's been in this with me since I was fighting and training. Uh, she's been in it from the very beginning with me. And so to do that together is a, is a big deal. And then, you know, lastly, I would just say to, to form the team and the, the environment and the coaches and, and for all those guys to buy into, to what we've done and own it all. Mm -hmm. Cause they can buy in, but that only means when it's good. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to own it? Cause if you own it, that means it's yours. Mm -hmm. And to watch them own it, that's a cool thing. And that's been, that's been something, there's so many more memories than that. But if you're asking me for a quick highlight reel, even though it's probably longer than what you wanted, <laughs> that's a quick highlight reel of, it's hard to compress that into one memory or one event given, you know, I've been doing this at this level, at the UFC level, I've been doing this almost 12 years. And so um, it's really hard to just pinpoint one, one of those, but that's a quick collection of a few. Yeah, no, that's great. I, and I know, obviously, you talk about uh, Rory Val and, and the kind of guys guys in your gym and stuff. That, and I was just wondering what what you kind of, you, you look for in a fighter and what, what kind of, what kind of separates the, the most, the most successful ones and the ones who, who don't necessarily make it to, to that level? What, what, what kind of elements do you feel like uh, separates that? I feel like one of the one of the things about mixed martial arts that makes fighters become great is that it, you have to be really good at all things. You can't just be great at one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen over time now as the as the MMA has evolved that it's good to be a specialist for sure, but you have to be really good at the other stuff as mm -hmm. well, and so. A lot of times what happens is um, most of the guys that I've trained, at least, they're all great athletes. They, they wouldn't be here if they weren't. Mm -hmm. But they struggled um, at the beginning to they weren't the best at it at the beginning. Yeah. They weren't. But they had the fortitude and the drive internally yeah. to progress past the white belt level past the blue belt level past the purple belt level and eventually you know if you get if you get to the ufc you're a black belt in mma i mean let's let's be honest this yeah. is the best in the world mm -hmm. here and i i mean if we're just categorizing stuff um and you're using mark's um terminology these guys are black belts they're all ninjas yeah, here yeah. you know and so to get to and i always say training as an amateur as a, as a young pro, as a mid-level regional pro, and then obviously fighting in the UFC. Before you get to the UFC, it's like you got your master's degree in college, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people aren't willing to get their master's degree in anything, especially when it comes to getting your punched in the face and getting choked out and um, all the sacrifice that they have to give. The, the biggest thing is, are they willing to sacrifice and chase a dream that most will say is not possible? And just because they're not the best on the mat, they are slightly delusional. Not overly delusional, but they're slightly delusional to where if they just got their ass kicked all day on the mat, they still leave the gym thinking they're the baddest motherfucker on the planet, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to have that slight, slight delusion. I'm not saying huge, but I'm saying you got to have that a little bit like, it don't matter. It's what makes you come back the next day though, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so you got to come back the next day. And so, and then when they hit black belt level and they hit the master, they, they graduated with their master's degree, 
It's not the end of it. That's just the beginning. Now it's time to go show all the stuff. The thing that annoys me the most is when people get a black belt and then they stop training. Yeah. What the hell are we doing? You got all the skills yeah. now to actually go be really good. And so to then accomplish a milestone like being in the UFC or like getting your black belt and then still getting your ass kicked while being what, what people would consider an expert and, and, and still get your ass kicked and, uh, and um, have, have the mental fortitude to still think you're the baddest MF on the planet, yeah, yeah. right? And so... Those kids, those ki- I think what makes those kids is some of the most gifted phys- physical athletes I've trained typically aren't the best fighters because their physical attributes allow them to be lazy because they can get away with it for a while until they get to this level, until they get yeah. to the UFC level. And then everyone's as good and gifted and... and but. But a lot of those guys that weren't as gifted as the one that was had to work so hard to get there that they built the work ethic and the mental fortitude to where this and this connects. It doesn't, it doesn't um, bypass each other. That piece is what, is what makes the, the, a great fighter is, is the fortitude to get here even though you weren't the best physically in the gym. Because I've seen some, you've heard all these stories every time you talk to anyone like me or anyone that's been in the sport for any, any amount of time, they're going to tell you, I've seen some amazing athletes in the gym that never made it. Yeah. Right? The guys that are just unbelievable in practice, but when the lights shine or if they, they become the nail a little bit, they can't handle it. And so... It's hard for me to say it's one trait or it's one thing. I I think it's a collection of what I just explained, but it's also time. What makes a great fighter? Time. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to go through all the bullshit to grow and and evolve into the ninja or into the master's degree level of what you're at, the black belt level? Are you willing to do all of that? most of the population would say no. And so you need time. I think that's the biggest thing is how, how do I know that that a kid can be who he's going to be? I need time. That's what I would say is it needs some time. Mm-hmm. You can see if a kid has it. Do you have yeah. a little dog in you? Right? I can teach you a lot of stuff. My coaches can teach them a lot of yeah. stuff. We could teach you amazing technique and, and philosophies and ranges and attacks and submissions and what defense but so do you have a little dog fire, in you fire in your yeah. Belly. yeah yeah do you have that mm-hmm. you know the fire in the belly is what i call a dog like do you have yeah. that dog in you exactly. and um a lot of people don't because like i said when you when it's time when you go from being the hammer to the nail is when you need the dog yeah or the fire in the belly that you where's that and and some some kids don't have that and i always categorize uh, mixed martial artists or fighters or however you want to say it in the three categories, right? You have a, you have a fighter, you have a mixed martial artist and you have an athlete. So, and they could be a mixture of the three, but you can, you can kind of say like, this kid's a mixed martial artist. This kid's a fighter. Like he, he'll fight at a drop of a hat, right? Yeah. Um, if for whatever, and, or this kid's a really good athlete. Can he form two of those things? And I think you need all three. You need all three. But, uh, and then you also need to know out of those three, who are you? Yeah. What's your purpose? Who are you? And so that, that, uh, that with time, understanding who you are as a fighter, and then time is, is how we know. Is how we know. It's just it's really tough to know at the beginning. I've seen kids where I've been like, man, that kid's going to be, he's going to be something. Uh, and you could see it in them, uh, but will they put the time in to actually get there? So I think the answer is time. Yeah. Well, no, I, I really appreciate your uh, your time talking to me as well. And um, I wish you success for the, the rest of the fight this weekend as well. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we can, we can do this again sometime as well. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. And um, huge supporter of yourself and Dan. And you guys are doing great stuff, so keep it up. Thank you, man. Appreciate awesome, it. Awesome, man. Good to see you. Cheers, man.